Welcome to the Every Nation West Coast podcast. We are so glad that you joined us. Let's get into the word. Let's pray. Father, Lord, we come before you this, this morning and we thank you for what you've already done through this service. And Lord, even as, I, as we go into the word now, I pray, Lord God, that you will speak to each of our hearts. Father, use me as your instrument. I pray, Lord God, that you will sharpen us through your word. I pray that you will transform us through your word. I pray, pray that you will change us through your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You can take your seats. So last week I spoke about the disciples being on the Sea of Galilee. And as they were on the Sea of Galilee, Jesus came walking towards them. They thought he was a ghost. And that's when that incident where Jesus called Peter out of the boat and Peter stepped out into an uncomfortable space, but he followed the lead of Jesus. And do you remember I gave you guys homework? Okay, everyone's like, "Uh uh-oh, what did we we supposed to do? I said, you need to go into this week and listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit and be willing to be made uncomfortable in the moment. So we're kind of on this theme of making you uncomfortable, okay? Um, So everyone says, amen. Amen. Um, So the title of my sermon today is Just One, Take the Risk. So we live in a society where we actually have a lot of messages that are opposite of risk. We have a lot of messages to be safe, okay? Got a lot of messages. If there's Um, If you're walking through a shop and there's a little yellow thing on the floor that says, be safe, don't slip here because they've just mopped the floor. We're we're meant to be safe and cross the road at the pedestrian crossing. We're meant to be safe and obey the rules of the road. Amen? Amen. Very few amens for that one. (laughs) We're meant to be safe and be aware of what is happening in our world around us. We're told, watch out. Watch out for someone who's going to come steal from you. Watch out for someone who's going to come and scam you. Watch out. Be careful. Be wise. Okay? And that's good to a degree. We're also programmed with even sayings in our lives that encourage us to be safe. I'm going to read a couple of things, and I want you to finish this. I want, I, there's a little phrase, and I want you to finish the phrase. So, you can't have your cake and eat it too. It's better to be safe than sorry. If it's too good to be true, it probably is. If it can go wrong, it will. Okay? Anything that goes up must come down. Keep both feet on the ground. Don't count your chickens before they hatch. Okay? I've got a whole list more, but we'll leave it at that. You get the point. Okay? We're, we're, we're programmed to be safe. And the problem is in our lives, in our Christian lives, that starts to shape who we are as well. We start to be safe. We start to be comfortable. We start to sort of, I'm not going to do this because it's, it feels a bit uncomfortable. It feels a bit risky. And so we've, we've been programmed. We're like, I'm going to trust God up to here, but I, I, am I going to let my heart go? And, and even as Kate, as we saw Kate, had to step out and trust God by putting in that application. And so she had to take the risk. And God's calling us to step out. God's calling us today to not live in a cocoon, to not live just safe. Now, COVID added to this by saying, let's be safe, let's protect, let's social distance from other people. Let's not be in big groups. Let's not talk to other people. And it kind of put us in a little cocoon. And I believe God's right now in a process where he's wanting to take us out of that cocoon again. So go in your Bibles to John 10, verse 10. And this scripture isn't going to be on the screen. Some of them will be there, but not this one. Or is it there? Yay, okay, it is there. It's amazing. I'm better than I thought. Um, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. This is Jesus speaking. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. And what we see here is Jesus saying, I'm wanting you to have an abundant life. Doesn't say I want you to have a safe life. Jesus is saying, I want you to have an abundant life. An abundant life is a life where we step out. An abundant life is a life where we take risks, where we see the adventure God's got for us. 
Open your Bibles to my next verse, which is John 1, verse 35. And John 1, verse 35 says the following, The next day, again, John was standing with two of his disciples. This is John the Baptist. He was standing with two of his disciples. And he looked at Jesus as he walked by and said, Behold the Lamb of God. So you can kind of picture these three. They're standing in a corner. And Jesus walks by and John goes, Behold the Lamb of God. And imagine you talking to these two, and these two immediately walk away from you, which they did with John, and they followed Jesus. And so the two disciples heard him say this, and they followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What are you seeking? And they said to him, Rabbi, which means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come, and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed Jesus was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which means Peter. So we have this amazing picture of these disciples talking, they're chatting to John. John walks past, I mean, Jesus walks past, and John points out Jesus and says, there's the Messiah. And these two disciples of John start following him, and they actually go up to him and say, where are you going? Where are you staying? And Jesus says, why? And they say, no, that we want to we come to where you are. And so they go with Jesus to where he is, and they stay with him. And then Andrew, one of these two, says, you know what, this is the Messiah, because he's now stayed with Jesus, he's experienced something, and he's like, this is the Messiah, and he goes and calls his brother Simon, which we know as Peter, Simon Peter, and he calls his brother, and he says, come, and Simon comes to Jesus, and Jesus looks at him, and it's interesting if you see that scripture, it says, you are Simon, the son of John, Jesus looks at his past, and says, this is who you are. And this is who, this is kind of your history. And then he says, you shall be called Cephas, which means Peter, which means the rock. So he says, he, he points out his future as well. Now, I want to, you to go to another scripture. I think this one isn't on the screen. Matthew 16, verse 18. Everyone looks at the screen to say, am I right or wrong? Um, Matthew 16, verse 18. And it says, and I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock... I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now we see this incredible pattern that Jesus is establishing here. We see this pattern. Firstly, John had a relationship with his disciples. He pointed them to Jesus they then walked to Jesus, and they went and they stayed with him. When we see stayed, it means they spent time with him. They were not on their phones, okay, doing something else, but they were with Jesus. They spent time with Jesus. Then they pointed others to Jesus. Andrew went, called his brother to Jesus. And when his brother came to Jesus, what did Jesus do? spoke about the past, spoke about the future, and we see Peter becoming a key leader in the early church. We see Peter going on to, at the, in the book of Acts, early in the book of Acts, we see how he preached, and 3,000 people got saved. All because his brother experienced Jesus and went and called, his, his, called Simon Peter and said, come, experience what I have experienced. Learn from what I have learned. Now you can see where I'm going with this. This is called the Great Commission. Now we read in, in Matthew 28, we read the Great Commission. Matthew 28 verse 16 says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, 
teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the ends of the age. And so we see what is Jesus doing here? He's saying to his disciples, part of what you are meant to do is go and make disciples. And that's what you and I are meant to do. That's what we are meant to do. We're not meant to be comfortable. He didn't say stay and have coffee. Okay? He didn't even say stay and have tea. He said go and make disciples. Go and make disciples. You and I are called to follow that pattern we see with Peter. We're called to follow the great commission that Jesus has called us to. Now I see fear in some of your eyes. Because you're like, your pastor, that's uncomfortable. Because it is uncomfortable. We see an interesting pattern if we look at the ministry of Jesus. Jesus walked with his disciples. If you read the Gospels, you see he walked with his disciples. But then in that process, he went into the homes of the sinner. He went into the homes of the, 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 the tax collector. He went into the homes of those who were considered sinners in that world. And he spent time with them. It's, he didn't walk with them. He didn't, he didn't follow after them. He walked with his disciples. He walked with his spiritual family. But he still went into their home. He still looked out for the lost. He still loved them. So go in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Now don't stress, I'm going to give you an answer now. Luke 15 verse 15 says, Now the tax collectors and sinners... We're all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. Oh, sorry, it's not. It's Luke 15, verse 1. Sorry, it's my. Uh, Luke 15, verse 1. This man receives sinners and eats with them. Verse 3. So he told them this parable What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he had lost his lot, comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner that, who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. And so we are called to go and look for those lost sheep. We are called to go and look for the lost um, Bill Hybels actually said, no one comes to Christ unless someone takes a risk. And I want you to think about your lives. You're here, you're saved, God's changed you. Someone took a risk to speak to you. Someone took a risk to maybe invite you to church. Someone took a risk. Now, as I was preparing this, now, maybe, let, me, let me start by saying evangelism, I can... I'm with you when, when I can say evangelism makes me nervous. Because I've also, my dad used to be an evangelist, and he used to go out, and he used to drag me out on the streets with him in a little town called Boxburg. And it wasn't my favorite time. Because also, my dad was quite argumentative, so it would end up being an argument. And, and it wasn't my favorite time. But I learned a lot from my dad because of his passion for God. And God used him. God used him in powerful ways in the lives of people. Now, God wants to use you and I. And as, as I was praying about this, now, we were not meant... So, so sorry, I'm going to step back slightly. There's some people, we have the fivefold ministry. Some people are called to be evangelists. They, they have that special gifting of evangelism. But that's not a cop-out for you and I. To say, I don't have that gifting, sorry, I'm going to make tea. Okay? God gives this great commission applies to you and I. And that's painful sometimes. So I was sitting preparing for the sermon. My daughter had a school thing, so she had like a competition. So I was sitting in the car, and I was preparing this sermon while I was waiting for her at her school. And I'm sitting in the car, and I'm busy, and I'm writing, and I'm saying, Lord, what do I do next? And out of the corner of her eye, I see a guy, he pulls up his car next to, next to where I am, and then he gets out of the car, and I'm, okay, I carry on working. And then a couple of minutes later, I see him, and he's struggling. And he's trying to, he obviously left his keys in the car, locked his keys in the car. So he's trying to, and he's got like a piece of metal, like a coat hanger, and he's trying to go down and try and fix it. And I look at him, and I'm like, okay, I'm preparing my sermon. 
And then the Holy Spirit speaks to me to say, what about love? Because it's raining outside. It also is like, what about love? And I'm like, okay, Lord. And so I make myself uncomfortable and I go up and say, can I help? Now, my technical skills are not that great. So, you know, I'm more moral support than anything else. But I start chatting to him. And it ends up, we have a great conversation. It ends up, we actually, I'm trying to feel out, is he a, you know, where is he on the faith journey? And I'm saying things like, we're trusting for a miracle here. And, and then he says, yes, praise God, we're trusting for a miracle. So I'm like, okay. Um, and it ends up being in that conversation, it ends up being his name is Richard, but he was born a Muslim. And he then gives me his testimony. And his testimony is, his, his actual name is Rashad. And so his testimony is that he, as he was growing up, he was very devout in going to mosque. He was very devout in sitting at the feet of, of the Iman and learning. But in his neighborhood, his next-door neighbors were Christian. And his next-door neighbors would invite him into their home for family devotions. And so he would sit there and, and be, have praise and worship and hear the word of God. And God started to do something through that time. And it, it kind of planted seeds in him to a few years later when he was older, he found himself sitting behind the wheel of his car in his driveway early in the morning, but he didn't know how he had got there because he had been drunk and on drugs. And suddenly he realized, I need God. And then he remembered that family who had invited him into their home who had spoken about Jesus. And then he turned to Jesus and started a journey. He actually changed his surname from his Muslim surname to Newman because he said, I'm a new man because of Jesus at work in my life. Now, what did it take? It took a neighbor taking a risk. It took a neighbor inviting a little Muslim boy into their home. And so we're talking about just one. And what, what my challenge to you and I today is to think about and pray for just one person, okay? I'm not saying go and evangelize with 700 people, okay? If that's what God gives you the grace to go evangelize 700 people. But imagine if each one of us, there's say 100 people here right now, if each one of us go and went out and reached just one person, how many is that? 200. And each one of those go and reach another 100. That's 300. Can you see how it grows? And so my challenge to you with this sermon is to identify just one person who you're going to pray for. Identify just one person, okay? Can you think of a person? I'm going to ask the team at the back, Matilda and, and Emily and Erin, to hand out. I'm going to give you a little piece of paper, and it looks like this. Uh, where is it? There. And it says, just one, take the risk, and it says, my just one. And you're going to write, whether now or at home, I want you to write, write the name of that just one. Now, it might be someone you're, you, you know at work. It might be a neighbor. It might be a friend. It might be someone that you jog with. And I want you to write down that name, and then this week, you're going to pray for that person. Now, how... How do we do this? And so I'm going to give you four steps. So you're going to write down the name of the person, and you're going to start to pray for them. But then there's four steps I'm going to give you. And you're going to follow these four steps, and you're going to trust God and stand in faith for God to work. The first step is the word relate. Okay, It's the first letter of the word risk, relate. And what that means is, is look to build a relationship with someone, okay? And that means you're going to be uncomfortable. You're going to try and build a relationship. I'm a shy person generally, so building new relationships is, is, is more difficult than some of our extroverts. But build a relationship. So for that person that just won, you're going to say, what am I going to do to build a relationship? Because that's what God wants us to do. God wants us to go through life looking out for people who we can pour his love into. And that does mean we can't be so distracted on our phone, for example. 
You know, I, I see people are like standing in a queue and they're all on their phone. Whereas isn't that a great opportunity while you're standing in a queue to speak to the person next to you and to get to know them and to connect with them? So that's what I did with Richard. I found a way to relate to him. And that was by actually helping him with his car. So you're going to relate. It does mean you're curious. You're going to ask questions. You're going to say, what, what, you know, what do you do? Like that's what I was asking Richard. I, I unpacked it. It took an hour. But I unpacked his story. And I spoke to him. And I could encourage him. So you're going to relate. You're going to take the first step. Many years ago, I had a man I, met, I sat next to on a plane, and his name was Abdul, and he was Muslim. And I built a relationship with him on that plane, and then we kept in contact. And I would speak life to him. I, would, I told him I'm a Christian. I told him I'm praying for him. Now, we never got to that space of him being saved, because what happened is then my phone died, and I lost his number. And then I had no way, because you, know, can't, you can't Google Abdul and find my Abdul. And, but I still pray for him. And I believe that God put me alongside him to speak life for that season, to lay, put seeds in his life. So God's got your Abdul somewhere there. I'm going to make you uncomfortable again. I'm going to turn to the person next to you. And you're going to answer this question. What would a perfect day look like for you? What would a perfect day look like? Look like for you. My wife's looking at me quizzically. Okay, so turn to the. Um, this is not a trick. You're just actually going to ask them, what, what would the perfect day look like for you? If you don't know their name, ask their name, and then what would a perfect day look like to you? <laughs> All right. Now, who found that uncomfortable? Okay, no one's willing to put up their hand. Okay, that wasn't so bad. Hey, because you were curious about someone. And that's what we meant to, that's as easy as it is. It's to turn to someone and ask them a question. Okay? Maybe, maybe like if you've just sat next to them, turning to them and say, what's the perfect day to you is a bit weird. But, but ask, be curious about someone. Open your heart and life. Because now you know, you know a little bit more. Now there's a deeper relationship. In one second, or in 30 seconds, you've established a, a better relationship with the person next to you. Okay? You at least know their name. So we need to build relationships. The second thing we're going to do, which is the eye of risk, is we're going to invite and invest. And what that means, it means present for them. It means doing what I did for Richard, investing time where we don't have time, investing time to go and serve, investing time to go and help, investing time to pick up their kids if their kids are stuck. Invest time to show them God's love. And then you're going to invite. You're going to invite them to something. You're going to say, we're having a Heritage Day market. Come and join us for lunch. We got church before, so just come for, you know, or just invite them to the Heritage Day market. Because then what do they do? They, you, you take them out of their, their, their safe space and you put them in a gentle way, in a way where they can hear God, where they can be ministered to. There because people invited people Come join us for a bribe. Invite them to church. Invite them to your connect group. It's the second letter, I. The third one is share. Then you're going to share the gospel with them. And for some of you, like, what does that look like? And so, so some of that is it's sharing your testimony. It's saying, it's, if you're sitting at work and you're going, you get some good news, and then you go, praise God, look, look at what happened in my life. That's a testimony. You're sharing the fact that God is at work, that you believe in something and someone higher than yourself, and you're, you're sharing the good news. Imagine if we had this life-saving medicine that would end all disease. We would want to tell our friends, right? Because we love them. We want to see them. This is the same thing. We've got a better medicine. It is also life-changing. And so we are called to share that. And trust God for the wisdom in terms of how you do it. To come at the right moment, to say the right thing at the, at the right time. And sometimes it takes just loving, 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 and trusting God for that moment to share. And that might be a year into that relationship. 
I've mentioned it before. I have a guy, one of my just ones, who is, his, 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 he walked past the church, and um, I was standing outside, and I said, hi, how are you? And he said, don't give me any of that beep, beep, beep. And so I said, well, why? Why do you feel so strongly? And he said, no, the church is just to rip you off. And he went on a whole tirade. And so I had an hour-long conversation with him then, because he's quite talkative. (laughs) But then what happened is then I've kept in contact with him. And I kind of go, come for coffee, come for coffee. No, 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 always an excuse. The dog died. You know, there's always an excuse. But I was persistent. And about a year and a half later, I invited him for coffee. He said, okay, pastor, I need a conversation. And we went and had a coffee, and we, I could speak and share then. I couldn't share up to then. All I could share was life. But then I, at that stage, I could share the gospel, and I could speak life into him. And it's still a bit of a journey with him, but I had to take the risk, right? So that's share. The fourth letter is to keep walking with the individual. The fourth thing is to keep walking is to keep saying, okay, I'm going to keep walking with you. I'm going to see you. I've shared the gospel. Now I want to, I want to keep putting those seeds in our lives. Remember, it's the Holy Spirit who convicts of sin. It's not our job to kind of throw, throw the Bible at them, beat them up with the Bible, okay? It's our job to love them. It's our job to speak truth into their lives and to trust the Holy Spirit to minister to them. And the Holy Spirit convicts of sin. And so you're praying for them, remember. You're keeping them in front of you, in front of your heart. And so when you keep walking with them, you're speaking truth to the lies. They might say, I'm a failure. They might lose their job, whatever. And they might say they're a failure, and you're saying, no, you're not. God's Word says, and you speak truth to the lies in their heart, and you're walking with them. So you've each got a piece of paper. It says, my just one. You're going to write the name of someone. Now, if you don't have a non-Christian that you're going to write a name on, then you're going to go find one, okay? Because God's going to bring that person to you, and then you're going to pray for that person. I've got someone who I identified this weekend, and it's the father of someone I know. And I'm praying for him. And I'm saying, I'm speaking life over him. But also what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to say, how do I connect with him? How do I relate to him? And then once I'm relating to him, because at the moment it's a distant relationship. But once I'm relating to him, I'm going to say, how do I invest in his life? What can I do to speak into his life, to, to, to invite him? And then I'm going to share with him. And then I'm going to keep walking with him. Do you get that? And that's what you're going to do. But it starts with you saying, I'm going to do just one. Now we're saying just one. And so we're saying in this month of September, we focused on just one. And we're going to ask you to take the risk. Are you, are you up to that? Yes. yes, I hear one yes. Okay, anyone else? Now I want us to take two takeaways from this, from this sermon here this morning. The first one is that I believe God's calling some of you to take a risk, we're talking evangelism, we're talking reaching people, but there's some of you that actually need to take a risk in other areas of your life as well, where God's calling you to step out of a comfort space, where God's calling you where you've been too cautious, God's been nudging you in areas and you refusing to move because you're too scared. And so if that's you, I want, we're going to pray for you in a moment. Craig D. Longsborough said, It is no secret that the greatest treasures are found in the most remote, inaccessible, and difficult places where we must pursue them with great energy and even greater risk. It's the same with our lives. Helen Keller said, Life is either a daring adventure or nothing at all. And so my call to you and I is to live lives of adventure, which means we're going to take a risk which means you're going to take that safety space and say, what's one thing I can do this week to not be safe? Yes, be safe on the road, do all the the, the normal things, okay? So don't drive recklessly and say the pastor said. Because don't phone me from prison and say, you said I must take a risk. 
The second part I want us to do is to pray for your just one, to identify them, and to say, what one thing can I do this week to build a relationship with them? Okay? And, say, and as you pray, you're saying, Holy Spirit, give me wisdom. Holy Spirit, help me to find the right pace, the right speed to do that. Can we do that? So in this month, we're going to be doing a couple of things. I'm going to ask the band to come up. We're going to have, finish off with a song. In this month, we're going to do a few things. We're going to have hospital visitations where we're going to go and we're going to pray for people in the hospital. And some of you go, yes, amen. Some of you go, oh, no, not me. But that's where this is taking a step. We're going to do an outreach where we're going to go and we're going to minister to people and we're going to go out two by two to speak to people. And for some of you, you like, that's where fear grips your heart. And I've seen every time I go, it's always a scary thing, but I'm amazed at what God does when we walk in obedience to do what he's called us to do. Okay? You're all right with that? Can I ask you to stand? We hope you were blessed by that word. For more information, visit our website at everynationwestcoast.org. Hope to see you next time.